Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for so many of you making the time to be here in what is already a swelteringly hot room, uh, which I imagine is only going to get more swelteringly hot. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, as I say, coming and, and, and accommodating the slightly revised time. Uh, my name is Jonathan Simons. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy here at the Varkey Foundation, uh, and it's my great pleasure indeed to moderate this session on all change uh, discussion in the UK education reforms. And I think it's probably fair to say that the UK has undergone possibly the most comprehensive and radical and far-reaching set of reforms of any major education country over the last seven years or so, uh, whether it's in teacher recruitment, curriculum, assessment, uh, funding, governance of schools, the ability to set up new schools, reforms to early years, technical education, universities, literally there has been almost no element of uh, UK, or to be more specific, English education uh, that has remained untouched. Uh, now, the motives behind, the impact of, the effectiveness of those reforms are hotly debated and will continue to be hotly debated, and evidence being what it is, uh, some of the effects of it will not be felt for a number of years, but that isn't going to stop people talking about it, and that isn't going to stop us talking about it now. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome an extremely high-quality panel to talk about it. Moving down the panel uh, from my immediate left to my far left, we have Nick Gibb, the Minister of State for School Standards at the Department for Education in the UK. We have Sir Michael Wilshaw, who until very recently was Her Majesty's Chief Inspectorate of Ofsted, which is the independent inspectorate of uh, schools, uh, skills and children's services. We have Professor Becky Francis, who is director of the world-renowned University College London Institute for Education. Uh, and last but by no means least, we have Brett Wigdorts, who is the founder and CEO of Teach First in the UK. So four incredibly qualified panelists to talk about the question of what was done in the UK, why was it done, what has been the impact, uh, and what does that mean for other countries and other ministries of education who might uh, be thinking about emulating some or all of what the UK has done. Uh, the way this is going to work is that each uh, speaker is going to speak for around or so 10 minutes or so, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. This may look like a panel discussion. Um, <laughs> I was thinking that. But as, as Vikas said this morning, we don't have panel discussions, so this is a briefing. So all four speakers are going to consecutively brief you, uh, and then there will be Q&A to the group of people that are not a panel. Uh, so without, without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to ask Nick Gibb to start the speaking. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And, and uh, yes, it's not a panel session. And thank you very much for not going to see Julia uh, Gillard as well. Um, and those that didn't know she is speaking, please don't go. Um, now, the reforms that we did introduce uh, from 2010 onwards have been very far-reaching. Uh, and they were, be they were designed to significantly raise standards, and they were designed to challenge the prevailing education orthodoxies at the time, and which still do uh, exist in our country. Teachers and head teachers essentially were given increased powers to improve their schools, greater professional autonomy combined with intelligent, strong accountability. The two features that the OECD said are essential uh, around the world to raising uh, standards in education. And already, we believe the, the fruits of our reforms are beginning to show. We've already seen a dramatic improvement in <laughs> children's reading age at the age of six, and almost 1.8 million more children are now in schools rated by uh, this man's organization, Ofsted, as good or outstanding this year compared with uh, 2010. Uh, but the true scale, as, as uh, Jonathan said, of what was achieved between 2010 and 2015 and beyond uh, is yet uh, to be fully appreciated. By 2010, uh, despite the best intentions of the previous uh, government, which was swept to power on Tony Blair's mantra of education, 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 the state school system in England was in decline, and our country's PISA uh, scores and rankings were a source of concern for a strong modern economy like Britain's. The national curriculum had been stripped of knowledge, leaving pupils without the core knowledge they needed. Schools were shepherded, shepherding too many pupils into so-called equivalent qualifications to inflate the school's ranking in the performance tables. The growth of so-called equivalences coincided with a sharp decline in the take-up of some highly valued uh, academic subjects, including a very significant decline in the numbers taking modern foreign languages. Grade inflation was rife, undermining 
national confidence in our national public qualifications. And Ofsted, before Michael got there, uh, was allowed to enforce its own pedagogical preferences and mark down schools that engaged in such things as teacher-led teaching. Or, and it even expressed a view, if you remember, Michael, um, about what color pen teachers should use in marking children's work. And conformity in the school system stifled uh, innovation. And thanks to our reforms uh, and the expansion of what we call the academies program and the free schools program, it allowed schools to opt out of local authority control. Teachers were, and head teachers, were given far greater control over the destiny of their school. The free schools program allowed uh, parents, teachers, education charities, other schools to open new schools. And these new free schools have greater control over their curriculum, over their administration and their vision, injecting a diversity and a competitive element into the system. And what we call academies, for those that uh, aren't familiar with it, are essentially existing uh, state schools that have decided to opt out of municipal local authority control. They're funded by the state and they're run by a charitable trust uh, and they are held to account through Ofsted, through performance tables, and through a contractual arrangement between the charitable trust that runs the school and the Secretary of State through a funding agreement. And academies, as a consequence, are freed from control by local authorities and are led instead by professional teachers and head teachers. We're trying to create a school-led education system rather than a municipal-led education system. And alongside the greater freedoms made available to teachers in free schools and academies, the government scrapped 20,000 pages of unnecessary regulation and guidance, freeing teachers to focus on teaching rather than complying. The government also wanted to empower teachers to tackle poor behavior in our schools. Clearer powers were given to teachers and head teachers to deal with poor behavior. And, it, and importantly, the government granted teachers anonymity from local press coverage if they faced allegations from pupils or parents. And whilst there is plenty of data to demonstrate the success of the academies and free schools program, the most compelling evidence for providing teachers and schools with greater freedom comes from visiting some of the highest performing academies and free schools uh, in England. Multi-academy trust groups such as the Harris Federation or the ARC Multi-Academy Trust or the Outwood Grange Group that was spun out of a highly successful state school in Yorkshire. And whether you look at uh, Reach Academy in Feltham, uh, Michaela Community School in Wembley, the City Academy in Hackney in London, uh, King Solomon Academy in uh, West London, or the Harris Academy in Battersea, there are some obvious similarities between those very successful schools. All of these schools that I've mentioned teach a stretching, knowledge-rich curriculum each has a strong approach to behavior management so teachers can teach. And all of these schools that I've mentioned serve disadvantaged communities, demonstrating that high academic and behavioral standards are not and must not be the preserve of wealthy pupils in wealthy parts of the country or in independent schools. The government twinned greater autonomy with a measured accountability framework designed to ensure that all pupils receive a high quality academic education. The government responded quickly to the scourge of so-called equivalent qualifications. And in all, following a review by Alice, Professor Alison Wolf, 96% of all non-GCSE and IGCSE qualifications have been removed from the school performance tables since 2010. And those non-GCSEs that remain in being taught in schools are of a very high quality. Importantly, the government freed teachers from the tyranny of Ofsted-style teaching methods. Now, in, praise, in search of praise from the school's inspectorate, lessons were filled with group work, segmented into short, engaging chunks, and teacher talk was minimized. Instead, from 2010, schools were judged based on their outcomes rather than the methods that the schools chose to use. And the reforms by Sir Michael Wilshaw ensured that these reforms were delivered. And he also improved the quality and rigor of the inspection process. But the real success of the school accountability system designed between 2010 
and 2015 has been the refinement and improvement of the national assessments taken in England schools. Two secondary school accountability measures have had a significant impact on the approach uh, schools took to the curriculum. In order to encourage schools <coughs> to enter more pupils into rigorous academic uh, GCSEs, the government introduced what was called the English Baccalaureate, which is a combination of academic subjects chosen from maths, English, at least two sciences, a, hum a humanity, either history or geography, and a foreign language. And this combination of subjects uh, provides pupils with a broad ac academic core of knowledge which provides them with the best opportunity of being admitted to the UK's most prestigious universities and the best opportunities more widely for those of all abilities. Now, the percentage of pupils taking each of these subjects and the percentage of pupils passing this combination of subjects is published each year in our performance tables. And since the introduction of that policy, the proportion of pupils sitting that combination of academic subjects has increased uh, from just over one-fifth to just under two-fifths. And this policy is helping to reverse the drift away from academic subjects that took place under previous governments, providing more pupils with that solid academic grounding that they need. Secondly, the government introduced Progress 8, a measure of school performance based on the amount of progress that pupils make at secondary school. Previously, schools have been judged based on the proportion of pupils reaching a certain threshold. And this led to a number of perverse incentives. Schools were not incentivized either to stretch the most able or to help the least able pupils. Instead, schools were encouraged to focus on that CD uh, borderline uh, uh, pupil, the cliff edge for the performance table measure. And thanks to Progress 8, which credits schools for every achievement and, and improvement a pupil uh, makes compared to their starting point, schools are now incentivized to provide a broad, balanced, and stretching curriculum to all of their pupils, and not just those on the border. Now, in primary schools, we reformed the curriculum, adopting uh, and adapting the best curricula from the most successful education systems in the world. Uh, 2016 was the first year that 11-year-olds were tested on this new, uh, more challenging curriculum. But it's our focus on how young children are taught to read that has been the most dramatic, that has uh, delivered the most dramatic results so far. For decades, it has been beyond doubt that systematic synthetic phonics is the most effective way of teaching children to read. Yet previous governments moved too slowly to ensure that all pupils were being taught to read using this method. As well as mandating early phonics instruction, the government introduced the phonics screening check, which is a teacher-led assessment of year one pupils' ability to decode simple words. A simple, low-stakes, one-to-one check to ensure pupils can read 40 simple words by sounding them out. In 2012, just 58% of England's six-year-olds reached the expected standard in that test. By 2016, thanks to the hard work of thousands of teachers and the use of phonics, 81% of six-year-olds passed the phonic screening check, and that amounts to 147,000 more six-year-olds on track to becoming fluent readers than in 2012. There are few, if any, more important policies for improving social mobility than ensuring that all pupils are taught to read effectively. Literacy is the foundation of high-quality, knowledge-rich education, and those opposed to the use of systematic synthetic phonics, I believe, are standing between pupils and the education that they deserve because the evidence for its eff effectiveness is overwhelming. So by combining autonomy, intelligent accountability, and the best teaching methods, dramatic improvements are occurring in England's schools. But possibly the most important components of the reforms in the last parliament was raising expectations for all pupils. The government inherited a national curriculum, as I said, stripped of knowledge, we reformed the curriculum in both primary and secondary, and we reformed the GCSEs and A-levels, strengthening their regulation through a strengthened independent regulator, Ofqual, and putting them, them on a par uh, with the best qualifications in the world. And the government wanted to ensure that all pupils were given access to high-quality, knowledge-rich curricula, culminating in world-class, respected 
qualifications. And not only did we end grade inflation, breathing confidence back into national qualifications, but we revised exam content to improve rigor and knowledge content, because every child has the right to an education in the best that has been thought and said. Making sure that all pupils are endowed with this knowledge is the key to creating a socially just and socially mobile society. The prevailing uh, international orthodoxy is for a curriculum focused on so-called 21st century skills. But a curriculum that prioritizes creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration instead of knowledge is doomed to fail. And it will fail to deliver creativity and critical thinking, the very thing that those curricula are designed to achieve. And from the work of Edie Hirsch, we know that pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds will be further disadvantaged by a so-called skills-based or competence-based curriculum. The international orthodoxy flies in the face of evidence, and I believe it flies in the face of common sense. In 2009, uh, Michael Gove, who is the architect and deliverer of these reforms uh, when he was Secretary of State for Education between 2010 and 2014, just before he, we were elected to government in 2010, he explained how the British people's common sense aligned with the soon-to-be government's belief in what education is for. He said, and I quote, the British people's common sense inclines them towards schools in which the principal activity is teaching, he said. The principal goal, he said, is academic attainment. The principal guiding every action is the wider spread of excellence, the initiation of new generations into the amazing achievements of humankind. In everything that the government did in education between 2010 and 2015, uh, the government took an evidence-based, common-sense approach. Teachers and head teachers, the people best placed to make decisions about schools, were empowered. Schools were incentivized to provide all pupils with the rigorous, evidence-based teaching that they deserved, and the revised national curriculum replaced a skills-based curriculum that was not fit for purpose with one that provides all pupils with the core knowledge needed to be successful in a modern and global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. And now we turn to uh, Sir Michael Wilshire. As I said, Sir Michael was uh, what we in the UK call Her Majesty's Chief Inspector, so the most senior uh, independent inspector of the quality of all elements of English education, particularly schools, uh, and he'll give us his reflections now. Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and the, the first thing I want to do is, uh, is to pay tribute to Nick Gibb, because although um, sometimes we disagreed, uh, and still do disagree on one or two things, uh, uh, Nick has injected real rigour into the curriculum and assessment systems in the UK. And as a minister over many years, he's worked incredibly hard to move our education system forward. And evidence of that is the rising, uh, the rising um, uh, number of youngsters, particularly at the age of 11, key stage two, two that are doing very well, are being prepared really well to go into, second, into secondary school. So he's done a fantastic job over the last few years to inject that rigour into our, into our system. There's a big danger in a panel like this to, for all of us to agree with each other. You might not, Becky, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to agree with each other and to be smug about what's so happening in the... Some, uh, uh, to be smug about what's happening in the English education system. Um, and we shouldn't be, and we shouldn't be, because there are parts of the English education system that aren't working well. Secondary school standards in the north of England, and, or in many parts of the north of England, and in the Midlands aren't good, and uh, the government must address the increasing differentials between what's happening after the age of 11 between London and the south of England, and the north and the Midlands, and the that the strongest multi-academy trusts are in London, are in the South, and they don't tend to be apart from the ones that Nick mentioned in the North and the Midlands. So there are places like Bradford and Doncaster and some of those satellite towns around the big cities that are, are badly underperforming. They're better than they were, but they're a long way from the standards we see in London, for example. 
Um, you know what uh, Winston Churchill said about Attlee? What did he say? Come on. This is, as a teacher, you see, I always like to engage the class. What did he say about Attlee? That, <laughs> see, it's a knowledge-based curriculum. Uh, he said that uh, Clement Attlee was a very modest man, and he had a lot to be modest about. Um, and that was the great reforming uh, prime minister in, in 1945. There's very, we, we don't need to be modest at this table. All of us involved in the English education system should be incredibly proud, and I speak as somebody who's worked in it for nearly half a century, we should be incredibly proud of the progress that, that English schools have made over the last few years because of the reforms that, uh, that Nick uh, has mentioned. Um, if you look at the PISA tables and you disaggregate those PISA tables, you will see that England is outperforming Scotland. And I'm really pleased it's outperforming Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> because, I hope there's no Scots in this audience, but... but uh, <laughs> But, but Scotland which, which always not to let Scotland go independent. Like. Yeah. <laughs> because Scotland used to be very sniffy and somewhat patronising about its preeminent position in the UK and how much better than they had, uh, that the, uh, how much better they were doing than than England. So we're outperforming. England is outperforming Scotland now, and that's a big issue for the SNP and and the Scottish government and for Nicola Sturgeon. And the English education system is outperforming Northern Ireland. Now, you might hear that Northern Ireland schools do better. They don't. Some of those grammar schools might do better. But actually, overall, England is doing better than Northern Ireland in the, P in the pizza ta tables, even with uh, grammar schools. And as for Wales, well, let's not go there, shall we? Um, and if you look at some of the statistics... Uh, that some of which uh, 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 Nick quoted. Nearly 70% of young youngsters uh, in England achieved the top grades, whereas 20 years ago it was less than 20%. Literacy and numeracy levels are rising very, very quickly, particularly in primary schools. Poor children, and I've always worked in London schools with, with poor children in inner city areas, uh, they're doing very well. In 2010, 12% of poor children went to university from the lowest quartile of income groups. In 2016, that's gone up to 20% going to university. Uh, and each year, 6% more youngsters from poor background are going to the Russell Group of universities. That's the top universities uh, in England. And Oxbridge is taking more state school pupils than ever before. The Progress 8 measures that were published recently, the top five or six schools were all comprehensive schools, Nick, actually. They were all comprehensive. They weren't grammar schools. They were comprehensive schools. And the EPI, the, the new sort of think tank that's been formed, of which I'm now a member, has shown that in terms of value-added progress, comprehensive schools are outperforming uh, grammar schools. The, the secretary, the education secretary, Justin Greening, is a comprehensive school you see where I'm, where I'm going, Nick, can't you, on this, um, is a comprehensive school girl. We have more comprehensive school youngsters in Parliament now um, than ever before, MPs in Parliament now than ever before. So when people bang on about social mobility or the lack of it, we're seeing greater social mobility than, than ever before. And there are two principal reasons why England is outperforming the other home nations and is doing uh, as well as we've just uh, been talking about. The first one, and I think it's a, it's a lesson for all juris, educational juris, jurisdictions, the first one is political will. Nothing happens in, edu in any education system unless you have strong political will to make it better from the top to the bottom. And by the top, we're always talking about prime ministers. When I first became a teacher, prime ministers did not talk about state education. And even when they did, like Callaghan did in 76, he was vilified for, do, for, for doing so. But now, prime ministers talk about standards. And that's really important for any state uh, system. Thatcher brought in the national curriculum. Major gave, gave schools their own budgets. Blair brought in the academy uh, program, which was extended by, by Cameron. And they appointed 
frontline people, frontline political people to be ministers of education in a way that they weren't frontline people when I became a teacher. From Baker and the national curriculum to, to Blunkett to Gove. And that fundamentally is what changes thing, things, is when governments see education as a top priority. And, and going round some, some, uh, some countries in the world, as I've done over the last few weeks, you see that that is something that, that is happening across the world. Governments suddenly realizing that they've got to put, put education at the very top of the political uh, agenda. And all those prime ministers that I've been talking to you about have emphasized the importance of a good education for all children, all children, not just a few. And, and that's the bit I worry about at the moment with the Grammar School Initiative, that will take our eyes off the ball of the great majority of children who need to have a good education. So we need to worry about that. Um, and the second big issue that has, has, made these, has brought these improvements is consistency. There has been a cons consistent, consistent strand running through education over the last 10 to 15 years, which Nick talked about, of saying schools should have the power, schools should have the resources, schools should have the autonomy, head teachers should be in charge. It's they, they're the ones that make the difference. It's not bureaucrats or civil servants in the town hall in Westland. It's they who should have the power. And as long as they're accountable, for that, that devolution of power, then things will work. And Ofsted is, was one of those levers of accountability along with league tables and, and so on and, and so, so forth. And that's a strand that should not be turned back. And I do worry that the Labour Party, if they ever got into power, which looks incredibly unlikely at the moment, <laughs> will want to give power back to, to local authorities. That would be one of the most foolish uh, mistakes ever made by a party in opposition now who may, be, may form the next government. It's working, and it, other jurisdictions are replicating what's being done here. There are dangers, one of, the, one of which I've just talked about, being smug about it, despite the progress we've made, and we need to tackle the things that uh, Ofsted is saying need, need to be tackled. Early intervention is critical. Local authorities did not intervene quickly enough. They did not challenge schools in the way that they should have done, and they did not support schools in the way that they should have done. And whatever system the government is now devising with regional schools, commissioners, and so on, they've got to intervene quickly. And there's been a, f a few arguments between my regional directors at Ofsted and the RSCs about that whole issue of early intervention before things start to, to slide. And the next and an obvious one, which might hold improvement back or further improvement back, is capacity issues. Have we got enough teachers in the system? Are they good enough? And have we got enough leaders in our system? And are, are they good enough? One of the great tragedies, I think, of what, of what uh, we are not doing at the moment, if leadership is key, and it is always key, well that leadership drives school improvement. A good head will drive a school forward. It was the first thing I did at Ofsted, was to change the judgments. So that the first judgment that we made was on leadership, because everything flows from good leadership. And what we're not doing in the UK system or the English education system is identifying good leaders early on and bringing them through and putting them to the places like Doncaster and Bradford that they need to, need to go to. We really do. The, end, uh, the National College of School uh, leadership <coughs> has not really delivered, and we need something else nationally to make sure we identify good people early on and bring them through and put them in the places that they needed most. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sir Michael. Uh, next, we turn to uh, Professor Becky Francis. Becky, as I said, is the director of the uh, UCL Institute for Education, which is a very uh, large teacher training and education-based research institute, uh, consistently ranked uh, number one in the world uh, for the quality of its education research. So, Becky, over to you. Thanks so much, Jonathan, and lovely to see so many people here today. And I notice the global audience, so I hope that we're not bamboozling you with acronyms and so on. I'll try to be careful. Um, I think the points have been really well made, actually, that the main changes in the time that we're, the period that we're looking at, 2010 to 2015, have been focused on the curriculum and on the sort of transformational impact of the Academies programme. And both of those initiatives reflect long-standing policy uh, interests since the turn of the century, actually, 
uh, in realising excellence across the state education system, while also simultaneously closing socioeconomic gaps for attainment and promoting social mobility. Now, social mobility and social justice are my areas of academic expertise and also my own personal passion. So I've followed these developments very closely, as well as having been privileged to have been involved in some of the developments themselves. Um, and as well as the changes in the Ofsted accountability measures that we've heard about already, I think I'd say that there have been four main areas of attention, <coughs> and I'll, I'll whiz through them briefly. Now, the curriculum I don't need to say much about because Nick has already covered that. I was also going to uh, refer to the review conducted by my old colleague, Professor Alison Wolfe, a hugely powerful and important piece of work that revealed that working class kids were being absolutely let down by our system. We've got a situation where um, exam boards and uh, the need for schools to kind of inflate their league table positions and so on were colluding really um, to drive kids, and these are you know, primarily disadvantaged kids, down um, vocational education routes that had no standing with employers when they left school. So from a social justice perspective, I'm very supportive um, of the fact that those have now been removed from the curriculum and we have a drive to back towards um, subject knowledge across the curriculum. Those, of, uh, again, I think Nick has already touched on this, the aim being that we facilitate the routes up, whether that's to a professional um, uh, uh, job outside school or, of course, into uh, higher education and, and so on. Um, a second area is accountability. And again, Nick has referred to Progress 8, which I agree, the clue's in the name, it's an extremely progressive um, educational uh, accountability matrix. It has two very progressive elements in the sense that firstly, it, it incentivizes schools to drive kids towards a broad and balanced curriculum. So militating against some of the dangers that I've um, just been describing. And secondly, as, as Nick outlined, it rewards schools for ensuring that kids are progressing whether that's your highest attainers, your lower, lowest attainers, where, wherever they are on the spectrum. And then the, the next two um, are my, speak to my particular areas of policy expertise. The first is socially redistributive funding for poorer pupils, uh, what we call, refer to as the pupil premium initiative. Since 2010, each pupil entitled to free school meals within a six-year period as a sort of broad indicator of potential poverty have been entitled to a sum of money that follows them into the school. That's £1,300, or just above that, for every primary school child and just under £1,000 for every secondary school child. So you can see that this is, you know, that's every year. You can see that this is quite meaningful funding. And the radical thing about that is that for the first time, this funding is ring-fenced to be spent on the kids that are generating that money. So not just washed up in the general funding of the school for head teachers to spend on whatever they like, but rather to be spent absolutely front and centre on the kids that, that, that need it most. A challenge there, given that this is my area of expertise, is on the one hand, it's right that we have autonomy about that because every school is different and each school's demographic is different and schools need to be bespoke in how they're strategically uh, spending the money according to the needs of their pupils. On the other hand, if they're not spending the money in evidence-based ways on things that work or they're spending it based on teacher stereotypes broadly rather than what the, the kids actually need, then we've got a problem. And um, I was involved in the policy shift to this being an area looked at by Ofsted, but nevertheless, I still think that there may be more that we can do to ensure that there's value for money in the way that schools spend the pupil premium. The second area, which I'll spend most time on, is the notion of jump-starting struggling schools in deprived areas. 
which was the original intention of the Sponsor Academy programme. And back in the, at the start of this programme, um, actually, uh, rather than schools choosing to become academies, struggling and failing schools were mandated to become academies by the government, and they were sort of rebooted, was the idea. These were schools in socially deprived areas. Um, they were taken over by a sponsor, so removed from the um, municipal local authority, and that, that sponsor might have been um, a philanthropist or a local business person and so on. They had additional funding from government and sometimes for the sponsor them, from the sponsor themselves. They often had shiny new buildings. There was a lot of money that went into that original initiative. And they had some freedoms over curriculum and spending. And that was the beginning of um, the academy movement. We then developed, um, we, saw, we saw the rise of academy chains, uh, multi-academies trusts, as they tend to be called, referred to now. Um, and really the idea in, for the government encouraging academy chains was that you would encourage school-to-school -school support within a family of schools, as well as a scale-up of uh, resourcing and so on. So we have um, a proliferation of academy chains, and then from 2011, we saw a mass scale-up of the academies program under Michael Gove and Nick, I think you were present at the time, um, to the uh, Converter Academy program, which is where outstanding and good schools were allowed to opt out of municipal control and to, be, to, to derive their own autonomy. But these were often schools that were very different from those included in the original academies program because these were our outstanding schools and indicatively often uh, they contained um, middle class pupils and so on and not necessarily um, in, in deprived areas. Although again, it's interesting which part of the country you're looking at. London is very diverse as, as we'd agree. Um, and this has led to an absolute structural transformation of our system. Um, academies now comprise a quarter of our schools overall, um, more than half of our secondary, that's your high schools, um, and there are over a thousand different academy chains. Often, often these are small in scale, but sometimes very big. So one of my um, ongoing pieces of work over the last four years now has been um, a report for the Sutton Trust education charity called Chain Effects, where we began to monitor different academy chains to see their impact in terms of their original intention to transform the performance and achievements of kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, several other pieces of research have come on stream since, since we began that, um, but we are, remain, uh, with Chain Effects, the only um, focus on the outcomes for disadvantaged pupils. And what we have found consistently has been a very mixed picture. Now, there are a handful of academy chains that have provided consistently outstanding results, and Nick has already referred to three of them, Harris, Ark, um, and Outward Grange. Um, this, is, this, this is for all their pupils, actually, but particularly for their disadvantaged students. These are remarkable performances that have you know, transformed the life chances of their students, tran transformed the schools in areas of disadvantage and from what you know, the sink schools that existed um, prior to these academies, and have also, I think, demonstrated right across the system what is possible. So brilliant exemplars of practice. But the majority of academy chains are still simply performing around the mean, for the mainstream mean for their um, disadvantaged pupils. And a group which is twice the size of those outstanding chains that I've mentioned are performing significantly worse for their disadvantaged kids than the mainstream average. And that's led us in our latest report to recommend that the government and the regional schools commissioners who are mandated to look after academies need to act radically and rapidly to ensure the promise of the policy program is realized or the program risks becoming part of the problem rather than the solution. 
And this finding, uh, finding about a mixed picture is now supported by other studies, uh, including actually the government's own statistics, of course. But um, it's also, of course, won't be probably any surprise to those of you in the audience who are from the United States or the Netherlands or many other countries that have embarked on this independent public schools initiative. Um, you know, we see examples of great practice, we see examples of disappointing practice, and the challenge is how we develop our accountability systems to look after this and, and to make sure that, that good practice comes through. Um, there have also been some unintended consequences of the Academy's programme in the British system. So it's definitely shaken up the system, but we now have um, a, a strange situation of a sort of twofold middle tier um, with our municipal uh, regions still having control of some schools and then regional schools commissioners looking after academies and regional schools commissioners having some um, control over accountability, which also often uh, leads to overlaps with Ofsted jurisdiction. Um, so there's a little bit of sorting out to be done there. We're also, unfortunately, beginning to see the development of untouchable schools, schools that no academy sponsor wants. In fact, they've developed an acronym for this, SNOWS, Schools No One Wants, um, which is, of course, dire for the kids within that school that has, you know, no government, no, 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 one, no one taking ownership of it and looking after it and which predictably tend to be schools in, in hard areas um, and in deprived communities. And there's a shortage of quality sponsors, which creates then a challenge for rigor, because if you want more great people coming into the system, you know, you have to be able to mandate them, but there's a real balance, isn't there, between encouragement and accountability again. So what needs to happen well, I would argue that we need to focus on teaching quality rather than structures. I think we've done a lot with structures in the British system recently um, when all the evidence shows that it's the quality of teaching that counts most and that's particularly the case for disadvantaged students. We need to continue this tight accountability in replacing struggling sponsors and cautious growth for academy chains. And we need to, as I've said, clarify the relationships between the regional schools commissioners, Ofsted, local authorities, and so on. And I would argue, certainly um, in contrast to Michael, that there are some very good local authorities. Um, the Institute of Education sits within Camden, for example, which is um, one example of a successful local authority. And I suppose that drawing on his very point about capacity... I would want to ensure that we are drawing on strength and capacity for excellence throughout the system, wherever it's found, and really encouraging high-performing MATs and local authorities to share their good practice across the system. That sharing and an evidence-based approach is absolutely crucial. And actually, I'm very, very encouraged that the government seems to be focusing on what is absolutely needed the sharing and the spread of excellence across the system um, with um, the new focus on opportunity areas and so on. We've already, of course, alluded to some of the, um, what I would consider to be more pr pr problematic um, approaches that are on the horizon as well, uh, grammar schools notably, um, and I'm really hoping that the government does continue to follow the evidence so that we have outstanding schools for all our young people. Thank you very much, Becky. And finally, we're going to hear from Brett Wigdort. Brett, as I said, is the Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Teach First, which is a charity and social enterprises which places uh, highly skilled graduates into schools uh, in challenging areas. Brett. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so it's definitely a disadvantage at going last in, in these sort of non-panel panel discussions, um, especially when I am sitting next to so many giants in the education sphere in the UK. Um, and I, I thought I'd split my talk up into three sections based on, on what the title is, which is what worked, what did it, and what does it mean for other countries? And I'm going to start what worked. Um, so when I started Teach First in 2002, 
there were two things. First, um, I was a management consultant, and I was on a project looking at how businesses could help education in London. And the reason I was on that project was because the business community in London were beside themselves at how bad um, graduates were from London state schools. And they felt there wasn't the talent coming out of London state schools there needed to be, and, and there was a real problem. And um, a minister at the time said there were schools in London that the person wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole or with a barge pole. Um, I visited schools in London where um, I don't think any of us would want to send our kids in, in thousands of years, where, where there was um, rioting, there was um, chaos, there was head teachers saying they just wanted the children to be happy. Um, there was, um, you know, just a lack of any clear learning objectives. Um, I asked the head of research at my management consultancy that I worked for, I said, find me an outstanding low-income school in London that we could learn from that's doing much better than the national average and has a majority of kids from low-income backgrounds. And they said at that point they couldn't find any. Um, so in 2002, London was in a state where there were very few, if any, um, really truly outstanding low-income schools. There were a lot of people out there who believed you couldn't have outstanding low-income schools and that it was perfectly acceptable to have schools with children uh, from low-income backgrounds where there was lack of learning objectives and um, you know, it was a school that was very different from the sort of school children from wealthier backgrounds would be at. Um, so if I think what's gone well, you just don't see that anymore. Um, you don't, definitely don't see that in London. And um, there's some places in England where you can see tiny bits of that. Um, if we're talking about the UK, you know, in the other nations, you can still see a bit of that in, in some of the other nations that I've, I've visited recently. But for the most part, that's something of the past. Um, schools uh, know what they're working towards. Every head teacher can tell you the learning objectives for the young people. There's uh, lots of outstanding low-income schools, especially in London. Um, and people know what success looks like, and they're working towards that success. So, I mean, that's a huge change over the last 15 years, and I think there's um, a lot of reasons for that. We've talked a lot about the autonomy to schools. I think that's been a really exciting change in England. Um, and it's something that really appeals to people with great leadership skills and, and people who want to make a difference. And um, you see that. There's lots of studies that showed schools that have a strong ethos do better. And the autonomy that schools have enabled them to have that strong ethos. Um, and there's so many leadership opportunities. Um, one example I can give is we're placing teachers in Wales and in England. In Wales, there's um, somewhat less autonomy and it's much more difficult to move into leadership roles in schools. Um, and as a result, a lot of our teachers who finish the original two-year placement move across the border into England afterwards because they want to get promoted quite quickly and they have tons of um, availability. And you see a lot of talent wanting to go into schools wh where they can be promoted and have that leadership. Um, and that's something that you can definitely get in the English school system today. Um, I think the belief that um, all schools need to meet some sort of minimum standards, um, that is hugely important, and that's made a huge change, and you see that everywhere. At the very least, there's no head teacher in the country who won't be paying lip service to those standards. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about the changes in qualifications, um, and you know I've seen that firsthand. We work now in a thousand low-income schools across England, um, and I remember visiting a school in 2009 where every child was taking travel and tourism GNVQ. And I asked the head teacher, um, you know, oh, wh why is every child here taking travel and tourism? And she said, well, it counts for four GCSEs, and that's really important. So we're having everyone do travel and tourism. Um, and, you know, I said, well, are any of them thinking of a job in travel and tourism? Is there? And that wasn't part of the um, even thought process, why the children were taking it. Um, there were tons of re stories about um, children, you know, in the C, D borderline. So there was a real statistic of percentage of children getting a C or above in this uh, GCSE exam. So those children on the C, D borderline would get a lot of uh, effort, and a lot of the teachers uh, we placed really, really struggled with this and really had concerns about this, while the children who were guaranteed below a, a D or a C and the children who were getting, you know, a C or a B, they weren't pushed towards an A. Um, and you could see those perverse incentives at work, and I think some of the, some of the new um, incentives are much better. Um, talked about some of these new outstanding schools like School 21, like Reach, King Solomon. You know, some of these free schools are very exciting. Um, I think on what hasn't worked, there's, there's a part of that too that I could talk about. But there's definitely some really exciting world-class schools. There's world-class schools that a lot of children from low-income backgrounds are going to. Um, and there's some real exciting, buzzy things happening where you can see, I think, some of global best practice happening in schools in low-income communities, definitely in London for a le much lesser extent outside London, and I think there's some really exciting things about there. 
Um, it's already been said about education being a top priority. Having worked in England for 15 years on this issue, it has been exciting that you've seen prime ministers um, appoint some very good secretaries of education. You've seen um, it be a top priority, talked about quite a bit. Um, and I think that is important. I, I've never felt education was a backwater in the policy sphere. Now, some people in the education sphere could complain about that. Maybe there's been too much um, focus on education. But I think that's been really um, a positive thing. And it's definitely made some very positive changes. Um, we are now, I mean, people talk very much about London, which is where Teach First started and where lots of initiatives start. I mean, I think legitimately London is one of the um, best places in the world, one of the better places in the world for children and also children from low-income backgrounds to go to school. That is hugely exciting to be in a city like that. Um, there's um, a lot of great results children are getting from low-income backgrounds. Um, you're seeing um, great reforms happening in London. And um, one statistic was that if London was um, the country as a whole, then the gap between low-income and high-income kids would be reduced by two-thirds. Um, and in many ways, it's better to be a low-income child living in London than a wealthier child living outside London, um, which is very exciting for London, but that gets to some of the things which haven't worked over the last um, 15 years, definitely as well as we would have liked. Um, you hear very few outstanding free schools being opened up outside London. Um, I have the story about 15 years ago when I visited this London school, which is now an outstanding school doing great work for young people, and that's exciting. About uh, six years ago, I visited a school in Grimsby, which is an area in a coastal uh, area in, um, in the Humberside. Um, I visited again a few months ago. I, I didn't see much improvement or much change in the school I visited. Similarly, in many of the coastal areas I visited over the years, um, it, it hasn't seen like uh, things have really improved as much as needed for children from low-income communities. And I think um, one of the things we're excited about is the government's focus on opportunity areas, which will hopefully expand to more and more of these areas, and really ensuring that these areas get additional support because they need a lot more growth. Um, one of the downsides of autonomy is you see a lot of talent going to the schools that already have a lot of talent. And this is something we see. So you see a wonderful school, King Solomon Academy, which was a Teach First ambassador, is a head teacher. They have wonderful teaching, fantastic results. It's probably one of the best schools in the world for children from low-income communities. Um, we get many less of these outstanding uh, teachers going to average schools across the country and try to raise their standards because they get attracted to schools um, that are exciting like that. I think there definitely needs to be a lot more work getting the talent into the schools that need it the most around the country, and I think uh, that really hasn't as much as we need. Um, it's sort of the elephant in the room, but uh, it's been talked about a bit that certainly from my perspective and Teach First perspective, and, and Becky mentioned it, it's much more about teaching than um, and, and the quality of teaching and the quality of leadership, and that's a huge focus of this conference, than it maybe is about um, how things are set up than about um, about uh, standards even now. Um, and I think there's still a lot of work that needs to happen on getting outstanding teaching and outstanding leadership into every school. Um, the most exciting thing about the system now is there is this autonomy. If you get a great head teacher, you get great teachers into the school, you get them focused um, in the right way, you give them really good support, and they can make enormous difference. They're not you know, hamstrung by too much bureaucracy, they're not hamstrung um, really by lots of difficulties they might have in other countries. They actually do have, I think, a lot of autonomy, a lot more actually than a lot um, of schools might see, um, because I've seen so many schools use this autonomy in really exciting ways. But some of the problems is, is there really is a difficulty recruiting enough outstanding teachers in England, and there's all sorts of reasons behind that. Some is um, the economy is very successful now for um, graduates. Some is uh, we need more teachers because there's a lot more students going through schools. But I think some is the fact that um, a lot of teacher um, support, a lot of um, professional development for teachers um, hasn't kept up in the way that you'd see in some of the best systems in the world, like Singapore or in China or Canada. Um, and, you know, in a system that desperately needs great head teachers across the country, um, I think it is a, a problem that there isn't yet, um, uh, there isn't a new, like, sort of national way to help support and train head teachers in a way that they need. Um, especially in STEM teaching, where we've seen, um, I think, real, real difficulty nationally, and a lot of head teachers would say their, their great difficulty um, is finding enough STEM teachers and um, continuing to develop them. Um, what we've seen, um, also is, I think, you know, there's been a bit of conversation about um, England now doing better than Wales and Scotland and improving. I think that's absolutely right. There's been um, great improvements over the years. I think um, in primary schools, there's been some fantastic improvements. I think um, some of the work on reading with, um, with um, phonics has really made a big difference and we've seen primary schools improve. Um, but I think what we've also seen is 
England still is falling way behind a lot of our competitors internationally. And um, I do worry sometimes talking to people um, that there can be a bit of smugness where we are still middling country in PISA results. We're not doing anywhere near as good as we need to do. At a time when Brexit is happening, um, we need to be competing with countries like Canada, which are um, world-class education systems, much less places um, you know, like the, like the Singapore's or, um, or uh, others that um, also are world-class education systems. And quite frankly, there's still a lot of schools around the country that are not allowing their children to get the education they need to be successful in the modern economy, um, out, especially outside London in the big cities. So um, if I were to say lessons and what it might mean for other countries, I think um, the autonomy has been a real step forward, um, a, a autonomy with accountability. I think uh, I've seen some really positive movement in that, and certainly some schools have used that autonomy with accountability to get great results for young people from the most challenged areas. Um, I think um, there needs to be um, a really complete focus on getting talent and um, developing talent in the system because um, the more autonomy you give the school system, the more talent is important. And uh, it would just be like any company, any organization, um, if you give a leader in a company or any organization more autonomy and more possibility, you also need to make sure that they have that support and they have the training and continuous professional development in a way that helps them uh, take up that burden. And I think that probably is the next step, what needs to happen in England. Um, and in my notes, I was told don't mention grammar schools, um, so I won't. But um, I would say that one of the big successes over the last 15 years I've been involved is um, it's been about making outstanding comprehensive schools across the country. And I mean, that has been a huge success of this government, of the previous government, of really telling everyone, I mean, Michael here, who, who is one of the first heads of a truly outstanding uh, low-income comprehensive school. I mean, the myth of 15 years ago that you can't have lots of poor kids in a school, in a comprehensive school, and make it outstanding, that's just been blown out of the water by great head teachers like Michael, by um, great policies, by all sorts of things. Um, and some of the most depressing things I've seen in England were going to East London and seeing outstanding schools where um, kids from low-income backgrounds are getting world-class education. You know, I would, I would put it next to some of the best schools in the world. I would put it next to some of the best Singaporean schools or elsewhere. And then you travel uh, 20 miles to the east into Kent, which has a grammar school system, and visit schools there. And um, they're very depressing places, I would say. Um, and every time you do create a very selective grammar school, by definition, you create a school that is a bit hollowed out. Um, and I think the government and the system has shown you can create outstanding comprehensive education for all. And the more we could focus as a system on that going forward, uh, the more we can ensure every child has the education they need. Thank you, Brett, and indeed, thank you, everyone. Now, we have uh, time for questions and answers now, either to the panel as a whole or to an individual. Uh, can I ask that you say your name and the uh, organization or country you're from? And can I also request that you keep your question brief and as a question, uh, which means your voice rises at the end and it has a question mark. <laughs> um, and we will, uh, we will direct your questions appropriately. I think there's a mic at the back. Do I see? Yes, there's a mic at the back. So if we take the gentleman right at the back and then the gentleman here. Yes, please. Uh, Alexander Nikitich from uh, Carfax Education Group. Uh, Britain has some of the worst schools in the world by, by, by some of the comments today, but also, of course, it has some of the best schools in the world. And the rest of the world knows Britain firstly, well, uh, only almost uh, for the best schools in the world, uh, the, the British independent schools. And uh, they do an awful lot. Uh, recently, there was statistics which is not very widely known that uh, actually the independent schools educate more children eligible for free school meals than the grammar schools, for instance. And yet, um, forever, they need to be, uh, they are under pressure to justify their existence. And even recently, there's been some former education secretaries uh, making suggestions on um, how to sort of uh, attack them yet again. And uh, what, I'm, uh, what I would like to ask was whether uh, 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 shouldn't more, or sh shouldn't something be done to, sort of to assert and protect this sector uh, as a sort of, um, as, uh, as something that definitely works and has been working for hundreds of years. Okay, so Thank a question you. on the independent schools, and then there's another question at the front here. Yeah, just there. Yeah. Indra Stepanovich, Lithuania, Member of Parliament, former Minister of Education. Uh, first of all, thank you for 
this nice insight from different, different uh, perspectives, uh, political, uh, academic, uh, practical point of view. Uh, I recognize many topics uh, our countries we are discussing uh, uh, in a similar manner. My question uh, would be maybe to Mr. Nick uh, uh, Gibb about financing instruments. I know that uh, uh, Britain has introduced a voucher-based system, uh, more or less similar to the Swedish model, uh, allowing uh, the same equal footing financing scheme for both public and private schools. Could you comment a little bit, maybe the other colleagues on the panel, um, uh, how this uh, is uh, moving forward? Uh, is it consensus uh, after a few years since its inception? Uh, I would be thankful for the uh, short comments. Okay, great, thank you very much. And we'll just take one oh, woman over on the other side there, just one more question and then we'll go to the panel. The founder, oh, hello, sorry. I'm the founder of a new charity called Invincible Me, and we're focusing on mental health training for teachers. So my question, I think, really is for Becky and Brett uh, around teacher training. And what you see is maybe the three areas that are missing from current teacher training, either for new teachers or with CPD. Thank you. Excellent. Three very good questions. Okay, so um, uh, let, let's, let's go down the panel and people can pick up what they want. Let's start with you, Nick. Well, the best of schools and the worst of schools. Um, I don't think we do have the worst schools uh, in, this, uh, in the world in this country. I think we, have, we do have some of the best schools in the world in this country. And we have some schools that we want to make into some of the best schools in the world. Um, the question was about uh, independent schools. Don't we need to protect them and not uh, criticize them? They have very considerable tax advantages uh, in this country, our independent sector, their charities and they gain all kinds of tax benefits as a consequence. And we are concerned that they help us to provide more good school places. That's what we're asking them to do in our recent consultation document. We also want our universities to help create more good school places, and we want really good outstanding schools and grammar schools to help us create more good school places as part of the ongoing uh, system of education reform. So it's not an attack on the independent sector. It, it, our, we have some very, very good and high-performing independent schools in this country, and they provide uh, a, a huge service to our economy and to 7% of children who go to those schools. But we do think there is scope for them to be able to help us more to create more good school places. And then the second question uh, that was directly uh, about the funding system um, we don't actually have a voucher system in that sense. We have pupil, uh, money following the pupil, but it only follows them into state-funded schools. It doesn't follow them if they go to an independent school. They then have to, if you go to an independent school, you have to find all the money yourself, unless, of course, you qualify for a bursary, which many independent schools uh, do deliver, but that, that money does not come from the taxpayer. I think it has been a very successful uh, system, money following the pupil. Uh, it, was, it, it was introduced in about the late 1980s uh, and it gives parents more choice and it does act to drive up uh, standards. We're reforming the system of how that money is distributed to schools. We're trying to make it fairer uh, and we'll have more to say on that uh, uh, when we, uh, after the consultation closes on the 22nd of March. Michael? Um, I've been very critical of the independent sector much to the annoyance of HMC, which is the organization which represents head teachers from the independent sector. Um, in terms of protection, they have been overprotected over, over many years. Um, and uh, as my colleagues have, have said, they're charities and they accrue significant tax advantages because they are charities. And if they're go going to continue with those tax advantages, they've got to demonstrate much more forcibly that they are helping the state system, and they're not doing that significantly. There's nothing wrong with, the, after all, academies are about independence. There's nothing, there's nothing to stop uh, independent schools sponsoring a local state school and making it an academy and showing them the way and, and helping them to improve performance. Very, very, very few do. They, they offer the odd lab here and the odd playing field there. It's, as I said, it's crumbs off their table, really. They're not helping significantly, and sooner or later, the axe will fall. Um, and they've, they've really got to get a grip on this one, otherwise, they'll lose those tax benefits. Okay, Becky? 
Um, well, just to add to that about um, private schools, um, the OECD is very, very clear about the importance and benefits of social mixing in education systems. And of course, our independent sector detracts from that because they select by wealth, but also very often by attainment too. Um, interestingly, to that end, the vast proportion of their scholarships actually go to wealthy young people that are selected through and incentivized on their attainment. Um, on average, the funding for the independent sector per, per child is three times that of a state educated child. Most parents simply can't afford it. Um, so is this a charitable endeavor, educating the world's global elite? I would argue not. Um, and in terms of um, teacher training, you know, this is a really interesting area. I'm delighted that Nick visited um, the Institute of Education just, just last week. We were sharing our practice with him. Um, in terms of what's missing, um, obviously I could wax lyrical about this and I'll, I'll leave most of the answer to Brett because I know he'll want to come in. Um, I think stability in the system is needed, particularly at a time of teacher shortage. We've very much welcomed that we have been allocated three years of allocation now for um, our, our student numbers, but we, went, we faced a very disruptive period uh, before that. Um, there's also questions, I think, about the length and commitment to teacher education in terms of really developing our teachers through their careers. And I think that in England, we could be doing much more about that. And I think higher education, you know, we should be thinking more about this as well, about how we support teachers through their career life course. Um, and very much, again, from my perspective, this is about infusing that with research evidence um, so that that's constantly a flow through through to schools and best practice. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first I would say, um, if I were to be slightly controversial, I don't think um, when, when you're saying England has the best schools in the world, um, I think we do have some of the best schools in the world. I wouldn't say necessarily they're the private schools. Um, and I think sometimes when you look at some of the evidence, um, private schools aren't necessarily as good as people often think, whether it's value added or in many other ways. Um, and I, I think actually we do have some of the best comprehensive schools in the world in England. Um, and um, I would also um, agree that, um, and I would also agree, I, I don't think, especially in England, we have some of the worst schools in the world anymore. We might have in the past, but even in some of the most difficult areas of the country, you know, they're okay. I wouldn't say they're, they're great, but um, I've been to enough schools in difficult places in America and some other countries to know they're not, not the worst in the world, not that they're as good as they need to be. Um, with, with the training, I would uh, completely agree with Becky that, you know, the one thing it, it seems to me the best uh, systems in the world have is um, they really take teacher professional development seriously, um, teacher mentoring, teacher development in lots of different ways. I think in the past, a lot of the CPD that teachers went to in England um, were potentially not as relevant, a bit ideological, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why it didn't work um, as well as it should have, but um, it's not helpful uh, not to still prioritize that in a way that um, you would for any other professional. And, you know, you go to a place, Singapore, which people often use, you know, their professional development for teachers is better than what I got as a, a top management consultant. And, um, you know, I think it's a huge reason why they're such a successful education system. Um, and I think it's also a reason why maybe the churn in, in uh, teaching in England is a bit higher than we would like. And uh, it's an important part to focus on. Um, we've redone our training recently in partnership with the Institute of Education and a number of other universities. And as part of that training, uh, we do have a focus on mental health, both of the teacher and how they could identify mental health issues with the young people, which is a, a key issue in England where children are among the unhappiest and have some of the highest mental health issues in the world um, for teenagers. Um, and uh, a lot of focus on differentiation. What we've basically seen is, um, you know, there's a real role for, for um, schools of education in the training. There's a real role for um, experiment experiential work in schools in the training. There's a real role for theoretical parts of the training. Um, and trying to put those together in a more comprehensive um, two-year program, I think, has been really successful, where, where they're integrated and, and, uh, and uh, the people going through the training understand why they're learning certain theories because it fits with certain things they've seen in schools and how it fits with pupil learning and, and I think that's really important. The other thing we integrate with all of our teacher training is the leadership aspects. We, we come from the belief that any successful classroom teacher is a leader um, and at, especially so in, in, in the English system where there is this um, autonomy that you need, to, um, you need to lead a classroom and you need to really see yourself responsible for those young people's success. 
Um, so there's a real element of leadership training that goes through the Teach First um, training from the beginning. Very good. I suppose this is probably the bit where I should make the obligatory plug for the Varki Foundation. Uh, and all of the work that we do at Varki is focused on exactly this issue of, of teacher quality and leadership quality. So uh, we, we focus entirely on that for school systems around the world. But let's, uh, let's go to another round of questions. Uh, so gentleman at the front there, one at the back there, and then the gentleman there. And then we'll take the fourth one here as well. Uh, and if you, do, if you do want to direct your question, please do, because we'll, otherwise we'll run out of time. Hi, this is Sanjeev Rai from Swedish Committee, Afghanistan. Uh, though the context of Afghanistan is uh, quite different from the UK, uh, but I think some of your reflection may be helpful uh, in our context as well. Uh, the, in, in the context of Afghanistan, uh, religion is also a dominant factor uh, with education. Uh, so uh, in that context, uh, in, in some part of the country, still uh, girls are not allowed to attend schools. I'm not talking about the quality of the schools and quality of the teacher training and other things. But they're not allowed uh, uh, to, to attend the schools. In this context, you don't have the capacity, you don't have even teacher tr uh, good functional teacher training colleges, you don't have qualified teachers, you don't have female teachers at least to convince parents to come to the uh, school. Uh, I think some of your reflection, and I'm linking with the morning discussion with global citizenship. I think some of your reflection on religion, education, and then what can be done in this context would be really helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, where else will we, the gentleman at the front here. Just here. <coughs> Hi there, uh, it's Will Hazen, I'm from the Times Education Supplement. Um, we've had reports recently that some schools are allegedly, um, because of the new progress measure, Progress 8, uh, managing low attaining students out of their schools before they sit their exams so they can sort of inflate uh, their performance. Um, do the panellists believe that's happening? Uh, and if it is, what should we do about it? Okay, thank you very much. There's a gentleman right at the front here and then, there's, and then the question right at the back. Hi, my name is Afonso Mendoza Reich. I'm an education social entrepreneur and I teach at university. Uh, my question is on the reform, you mentioned that the importance of autonomy. My question is which measures, this could be for Nick and Becky, what measures did you develop to monitor and follow up with schools that actually are enabling and are not pervasive? Let's say that the measures to, mon to monitor the progress of schools that you gave that autonomy that actually help them perform better and it's not just creating any sort of measure that may lead them in the wrong way. Okay. Was my question clear? Thank you very much. Then there was a question right at the back, and then we'll go to the panel. Bao Wan Singh, originally from Singapore, since you've mentioned Singapore <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, I head up a philanthropic trust in London. Uh, I guess a, I had a question about schools. If a school is doing very well, uh, you know, why push it to support other schools and instead of encouraging it to continue doing what it does very well? Uh, our experience suggests that sometimes when you push schools to support other schools, it might not be a skill set that they have. Isn't it the responsibility of education authorities and ex experts to come in and study a school that's doing very well and then support other schools to use that and, and uh, replicate that? Thank you. Okay. Um, right, so, uh, Brett, why don't, uh, why don't you answer that last question? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> hey, Jonathan. Um, um, What's interesting, so um, I, I've been lucky to, I guess, see schools, see some of the best systems in the world and, and visit schools around the world. And it does feel to me what the best systems have in common. You know, they have very little in common, actually, in some respects, in that some, you know, do a lot of testing, some do little testing, some, they all do different things. I think what they all do have in common is schools are supporting each other in one way or another. Um, and teachers are mentoring other teachers as professionals. Schools feel responsibility for the wider, um, the wider you know, um, education system, and you know, as much as possible it's a school or a teacher-led system rather than a, you know, let's say a politician-led system often. You know? And I think that is, a, so in my mind, it is absolutely a successful school's responsibility to support other schools, and they, they should see that as a responsibility. And it's absolutely a responsibility for successful teachers to mentor and support other teachers, because that's what it means to be a successful professional. And you know, um, being a successful school 
you know, isn't just about those children in the school. You have to be um, someone who helps the entire sector because it can't be the zero-sum game. So I think that's something that all the best systems have in common. And, um, you know, the more that can happen in England, I would say the better. Okay. Uh, Becky, why don't you pick up the, the question, particularly the first question on sort of the role of the small topic of girls' education and religion and global citizenship. <laughs> well, I hope some others will come in as well, because I don't know if I'm very well equipped to answer your question. I mean, one of my specialisms has been gender in education, but obviously that has been um, in, in the West, um, so very, very different context that we're talking about. Um, I guess the, the importance of this issue uh, can't be understated from any perspective, whether it's a justice perspective or whether it's an economic perspective, because we know that girls' education is what absolutely galvanizes economies ac across the world. So obviously this is a massive um, challenge from a whole range of perspectives. Um, I guess that what I would say in a slightly lame way is that hopefully um, it's precisely these kind of challenges that organizations like the Varkey Foundation and actually events like this where people come together can actually help because I think that what would be much better than me answering this question is for you to be able to talk to uh, ministers or practitioner experts from countries that have had similar challenges but have been able to grow and what they did and how they squared that circle um, and I really hope that you get time to do that other people may uh, may um, want to come in just um, crossing over to the progress 8 question because progress 8 is something that I've very strongly supported um, I know there are lots of reports about the potential to gain Progress 8 and um, this the potential to manage kids out of the system, which actually had been an accusation for, for many years for many different reasons, is obviously very worrying. What I think is brilliant about Progress 8 is that for the first time perhaps ever in our system, let's face it, it incentivizes and motivates a focus on our low attainers, which is where the English education system particularly fails to support our, our lowest attainers. So I think that that has to be good. It may be that we um, need a specific, um, you know, a, a specific look and attention to this, perhaps through Ofsted, to check pupil movement in and out of schools. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think that that shouldn't detract from the policy overall. And, and Michael, when you were head of Ofsted, did you see schools gaming the system, dropping out pupils, pushing well, them away for their exams? If we ever did it, then um, um, we would fail. If, if we found schools doing something like that, then we would fail them and put them into, into special uh, measures. Um, if, if the word on the grapevine was that a school is doing that, and the local community often would tell you that, and parents sometimes would, would tell you that, or occasionally the odd teacher would tell you uh, that was happening, then we would investigate it thoroughly. And if, if we saw it as a big national issue, uh, as we saw other issues being very important, we would create a task force to do something uh, about that. Um, so that is worrying if it, if it happens, um, but uh, Offset has a key part to play. On the issue of, of girls' education, one of the great things, I think, about the English education system is that we collect data very well now. It's one of uh, the great strengths of the English education system that we know how schools are doing on a, on a year by year, term, almost term by term basis. And we also know how particular groups of children are doing in the school. Uh, ethnic minority children, white children, <coughs> etc., etc., the most able children, how they are doing, and whether the school is doing well for them compared to other groups, and whether they, the school is adding value. And girls, the, the performance of girls is a key part of that, and Ofsted will always comment on the performance of girls in relation to, bi to boys, and we all know that girls are doing better uh, nationally uh, than boys at, at almost all levels. It's boys' underachievement that, that the country has to worry about, and particularly white working class or white boys from low-income backgrounds uh, are, are doing uh, wor worst of all. So uh, data is very important, but girls are doing well, well in, in, in England and in the UK generally. Thank you. And Nick, mm -hmm. do you want to expand on the, the question we had at the front about, you know, how, how do we, we give school these autonomy? How do we know? How do we track that they're not wasting their autonomy, and then do you also want to pick up the point on, uh, on gaming the system? 
Yes, on the, uh, the Progress 8 issue, uh, I, I, I echo Becky's points. There's nothing in Progress 8 that should add to that incentive. If anything, it reduces that incentive because there is more incentive now to help those children who are uh, struggling to get uh, a, a, a good grade at GCSE that counts towards the credits that the school achieves. Um, and again, if there is evidence, then Ofsted, I think, would take a very dim view of such approaches. We're actually funding schools under the new national funding formula more generously for schools that have children who have a low prior attainment. Um, it's a higher level than the, uh, the, the, than the aggregation of all the local funding formula because we do believe that schools should be uh, ensuring that children who do join a school with low prior attainment are given all the support and help that they need. In terms of uh, what measures to monitor the autonomy, there are many accountability measures. The whole point of the OECD, they, say, they said that you need to have autonomy combined with strong, <coughs> strong accountability measures. So we have the performance tables. So the exam results of every secondary school at 16 and 18 are published. Um, and so the proportion achieving the Progress 8 figure or indeed the absolute level of attainment or indeed the English baccalaureate combination of core academic subjects they're all published uh, publicly and and at primary school there's uh, tests taken at the age of 11 in English reading writing and maths and they're published uh, so they there is that then there's the Ofsted inspection process and their reports are published and uh, there are powers that the regional schools commissioners have through the Secretary of State when schools significantly underperform we have the regional schools commissioners who act on behalf of the Secretary of State to monitor underperforming academies. Uh, and we have a funding agreement between academies and the Secretary of State that has certain minimum requirements that the school has to deliver. And if they don't deliver that, the funding agreement can be terminated and the trustees uh, uh, lose the school and we will broker it into another trust. Um, in terms of uh, why should schools support uh, underperforming schools, well, it is a system of collaboration. It works. Uh, we now have 1.8 million more pupils in good and outstanding schools as a consequence of the reforms, of, of hard work of the profession, and uh, as a consequence of this kind of collaboration. We, we established this concept called National Leaders of Education. These are high-performing head teachers who've reached the peak of their profession, and it makes sense for them to use that experience and skill uh, to help other schools apply the same DNA that's, they've, that's been successful in their own school to the new school. And the other thing that's happening is that these academies, 60% of all secondary schools now are academies, and they're beginning to form into these multi-academy trusts. <coughs> and the trust themselves, the multi-academy trust itself, is now being held to account through uh, Ofsted doing their uh, sort of sequential uh, inspection of many schools in a trust, combined with performance tables of multi-academy trusts, and we're learning from what the best multi-academy trusts do. So the evidence of effective practice is now much more in the open is, and is much more part of discussion at conferences like this and uh, research conferences like Research Ed and so on. Um, so I think this collaboration is part of a school-led system, whether it's through multi-academy trusts or it's through national leaders of education helping uh, neighboring schools. Very good. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there because uh, we are going to run out of time. Um, but thank you very much indeed. A hugely uh, fantastic session. Uh, can I just ask you now to express your thanks to Nick Gibb, Michael Wilshaw, Becky Francis and Brett Wigdorf. Thank you. <laughs>